Hello, my name is Siraki Akizimana, and uh, I am based in the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at uh, the University of the Western Cape uh, in South Africa. We would like to thank the conference organizers for giving us the opportunity to participate in this fascinating web conference on Africa's uh, commons. Let me uh, then take this golden opportunity uh, to welcome you all, uh, wherever you are following us from in all corners of the world, uh, for this exciting panel discussion on the destinies uh, of African uh, commons in the, context, in the context of highly contested uh, rural futures in Africa that will be presented by the Young African Researchers in Agriculture Network, or YARA. Just a few words about the uh, YARA Network before we proceed uh, 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 with our presentation. YARA is a, a network of young and uh, early career African researchers working on uh, Africa's agrarian transformation and African uh, food systems across the African continent. The YARA network is uh, currently represented in about 31 African countries and uh, its secretariat is hosted uh, by the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies Plus at the University of the Western Cape, located in the beautiful city of Cape Town in the Republic of uh, South Africa. Just to introduce this panel, uh, Africa's rural areas are currently undergoing dramatic uh, changes. Uh, this includes, among other things, the expansion of wildlife conservation areas, including transband uh, transboundary and uh, private initiatives, booming mining activities, and the other forms of uh, resources extraction, massive infrastructural development, and the major global investment in large-scale agricultural schemes. Against this background, uh, rural Africa has emerged as a, a battleground for ambitious high-level national and international visions and the development agendas uh, and the global concern over climate change biodiversity conservation and the food security. These mega trends have stimulated the debates on the trajectories of agrarian change and the, the protracted implications for the futures of Africa's, uh, uh, Africa's commons, food systems and the rural livelihoods in the contemporary Africa within the ambit of the rapid modernizing uh, wave. Today, we are really privileged to have four, uh, four young, uh, 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 capable female African academics uh, who will be exploring different aspects of this important debate in a different African context using um, different theoretical, conceptual, and uh, political perspectives. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Faustina. Obeng Odama, who is a, a graduate research fellow at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Ghana and a PhD uh, candidate at uh, Banwangen University uh, and the research in the Netherlands. First, now we tackle these important issues um, in the West African context. Sit, relax, and enjoy the talk. Over to you, Faustina. Thank you, Syriac. Let me start sharing my screen with the audience. So I would speak in the context of changing land governance through a plant disease eradication program in, in Ghana's cocoa sector. So a bit of background and context, land has increasingly now been recognized as a commodity in which people trade in. 
and in West Africa and especially in Ghana, where land governance is primarily through the customary system, this has ignited debates on really what dynamics are the customary system going through in this um, era of land commoditization. So um, in the cocoa sector in particular, land, um, customary land governance system has been problematized as one of the reasons why farmers in general do not make a lot of investments in their farms because of the insecurities attached to this. And there has been recommendations to move towards um, um, titling and registration of lands among smallholder farmers. So for this particular presentation, I try to highlight the ongoing process of land commoditization within the whole cocoa landscape and try to see the intersection of this macro process with a specific process of um, cocoa swollen shoot viral disease eradication and how this constructs the fluidity of land governance and the implications it has for rural livelihoods. I do this in the particular context of Western North region in Ghana, which is dominated by the Sefi people. So in the subsequent slides, I would use the, the name Sefi more than the Western North region of Ghana. So a bit of um, context into how um, land tenure is changing within the Sefi Koko landscape. Land tenure in the Sefi landscape really um, opens up in the 1960s when the frontier of production for cocoa moved towards that area. It was noted that the forests there were sparsely populated, so it was a, an interesting area for many cocoa farmers in other regions to move in and acquire land. Now many of these migrants acquire land through first clearance, and then the migrants settled in this region before the indigents joined them and also acquired lands through first clearance. But what the first clearance did for the indigents was it gave them freehold access, whilst for migrants, their tenure was somehow um, defined in relation to the life of the tree that they planted. Fast forward to the 1980s, there were massive bushfires in Ghana, which burned both forest and cocoa farms. So afterwards, land was supposedly no longer by first clearance, but acquired through sharecropping. And one only had to present some schnapps and enter into a sharecropping arrangement. But in the 2000s, the sharecropping arrangement changed. Around that period, schnapps were taken all right, but in addition to schnapps, the person had to also pay money. And that was evidence of commercialization. That was also attributed to land scarcity, resulting from um, a sudden interest in forest conservation within the cocoa landscape. Fast forward to the 2010s, the chief now came out with new directive that all migrants that have acquired land and occupied it for more than 50 years should renegotiate for that land. The migrants in general did not really um, heed to this initiative, but then there was an outbreak of swollen shoot and this chief saw that as an opportunity to invoke the traditional norm of, of tying tenure security to land, to the, to the tree life. So CSSVD has been an important um, um, factor in the cocoa sector and its eradication is important. Now in the 1940s, the eradication faced resistance a lot and generally these were around welfare related issues because cocoa incomes would be lost. In the 1960s, there was a switch from a compulsory state sponsored kind of eradication to farmers. Um, farmers were supposed to cut their own plants, but of course the welfare related issues were still there, so they did not cut. In the 1980s, in addition to the welfare related resistance, then the tenure issues also became an important issue. And in 2010, the current epicenter is within the Sefi area. And then over there, the chiefs have also started um, requiring migrants to renegotiate land. So there's an intersection of the, of the land precarities and then the swollen shoot viral disease playing out in the Sefi area. So the context of Sefi is particularly important because it's an important cocoa growing area. And so for the government, CSSVD in cocoa means that the government will lose a, a lot of the production figures from, from Ghana and it may lose its place in the global, global cocoa industry as an important producing country. So government has to find a way of solving CSSVD and it means that they have to now solve the tenure related resistance. Because currently the picture on the right is how cocoa farms look like. And so long as farmers do not cut down the cocoa, then traditionally they haven't violated the norm. 
So in, in the quest to implement the eradication program, the government now moves the whole land-related resistance between farmers and chiefs to become an issue between chiefs and government. And they negotiate with chiefs to now pay around um, $70 per acre for, for each um, farmer. $70 per acre for all the farmers. And then the chiefs will now then give the farmers a leasehold document which the farmers can use to register their land. The important outcome is because of this cutting down has started and then the, the eradication program is ongoing. But the consequences of this is the fact that because of the payments that have taken place, there is a reinterpretation of the customary norms now. In the past, the whole norm of tying tenure security to plants life was to make sure that migrants do not leave their lands unattended to, but would produce cocoa and then the local economy would boom. But now that has been institutionalized as a real way of defining tenure security. And interestingly is the fact that even farms that are eight, less than eight years old have also been affected by this. Now, another dimension is the blurred lines that is um, rising between trusteeship and landlordism. So now the roles of chiefs as trustees or landlords is really blurred because they are payments of money and it's not so clear what that monies are being used for, whether they are the personal monies of chiefs or they are, they are for the community development. And because monies are involved, there is evidence of some conflicts that is arising among sub-chiefs. They are claiming more boundaries, of course, to make sure that they get more of the money. Then there is also another emerging conflict between sub-chiefs and subgroups that acquired um, land through first clearance. And so by, by virtue of that had customary freehold, it is not clear where the freeholders get a share of this money. Then there is also another emerging issue between um, sharecroppers, indigenous who acquired lands through sharecropping, and then the chiefs, because they do not know whether beyond this eradication program, they would also have to now pay for, for renegotiations of the land. Another interesting dimension is the fact that customary governance is now intersecting with leaseholds, which are sort of derived from common law governance, not necessarily customary law governance. And then because of the whole titling thing that is associated with this, it's, it gives the impression that land markets are spreading into these rural areas. It's already a, an established phenomenon in the urban landscape in Ghana, but in rural areas, these are some of the processes that are spreading the land markets and individual titling. Now, I try to conclude with some implications of this for rural fut futures. Now, finding value is the, is the, is the main um, issue driving land commodification. And so for chiefs who are the allodial interest holders, as well as um, um, families that hold the customary freehold, there is this quest to search for more value for land. And more value for land um, is usually conceived in economic terms. So it dissipates the whole communitarian principles that underline the, the customary norms or customary governance system. And because these communitarian principles are dissipated, land access through the customary governance is increasingly becoming less favorable for the rural youth, for migrants, and for, for women especially. Then again, because um, finding value is a major driver of commoditization, individuals who also have um, individual titling to lands are increasingly also looking for value for their lands. And then for many of these um, individual holders, the, the emerging dynamic within the cocoa landscape is, is smallholder, um, small scale artisanal mining. And these small scale miners are pro providing huge amounts of monies for an acre of land, sometimes rising to around $1,316 per acre. And for these farmers with individual titles, they see these monies are as huge and better than what they will earn if they continue producing their cocoa. So then it, the, the individual titling also gives the individual holder some sort of flexibility in also deciding what value to put their own land to. And so because of that, farms, um, rural lands are potentially going to be taken away from farming into small scale mining. And the picture on the right shows how a typical land that has been put to small scale mining looks like. So the land will be available all right, but within, after small scale mining, it is just a land that cannot be put to use for, for the rural populace anymore. So thank you, Syriac. 
Thank you so much, uh, Faustina, for such a fascinating uh, presentation, which really uh, map out how the changing, um, the changing land tenure systems in the customer area, driven mainly by increasing land commodification, is actually affecting the, um, you know, the, the commons and the preservation of the commons with uh, the advent of uh, different, you know, activities like, uh, you know, small scale mining and other, you know, activities that are inventing even the little, uh, you know, kind of, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, commons that, uh, you know, are there. Uh, it will be very fascinating to engage you at the, uh, probably during the Q&A, uh, to link up with um, these processes of, uh, commodific of land commodification, what, what is the implications of these processes of land commodification happening in this particular cocoa growing uh, areas are affecting the, you know, the, the preservation and the conservation of African commons in one way or another. But are we, are we, are we, let, me, let me leave it there, something that to, to, to pound around. Uh, maybe we're going to come back to, you know, to that debate um, you know, later on. Uh, um, uh, let me, from uh, West Africa, let me move straight to Southern Africa. Uh, but uh, before um, I move it to, I introduce our colleague from uh, Southern Africa, I would like it to, um, you know, to remind our, our viewers, those who are following us, please, if you've got a, a question or a comment or a clarification as we are proceeding with this uh, exciting and uh, fascinating uh, presentation from these African young minds, uh, please do drop as the if you go on on the screen uh, down uh, in the Q and A, just click there and then drop us your questions or your comments or just engage with them, and they will be able to uh, you know to, to we are really looking forward to engage with you. Uh, it might be a question you might want to you know to challenge their views and their opinion, and yeah, yeah you are most welcome and just feel free. Uh, um, we we are really we wanted to you know we wanted to make this uh, this moment very exciting, very engaging, uh, you know, very active uh, with uh, with uh, with our viewership uh, around the world. Uh, as I've uh, as I've mentioned, now I would like it to move it to from uh, West Africa. Uh, um, I would like it to move straight to Southern Africa, where we found another really capable young African mind there, uh, who will be looking at these particular issues that uh, Faustina was uh, highlighting, uh, but uh, uh, from a much more legal. Uh, perspective. So please do allow me to uh, present it to you. Uh, my sister uh, Dimona Piri Simpaya from uh, Zambia and uh, who is currently based at the uh, uh, Medici Land Governance. Um, over to you, uh, Dimona. Thank you, Suyak. Thank you for that. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so my presentation is a legal analysis of disjunctions between customary and statutory land tenure regimes in, in Zambia. And the focus of this particular uh, uh, presentation, or the, uh, I'll talk specifically about the research that was conducted. The focus of the research was mainly to uh, to address the inadequate legal recognition of the strength of rights to land and natural resources uh, derived from custom, but also to also uh, see how we can, uh, how, how land rights can actually be recognized as well as secured in law, as well as in practice. So there are so many efforts that have been made by the government, uh, as well as other key uh, players, uh, in either institutions or just other bodies that have played a key role in this area, but they're still, a lot of long uh, standing challenges that have remained unresolved. And uh, this presentation actually gets, gets to just unearth some of them. 
So the heart of many issues surrounding law in post-colonial, I'm talking about Zambia because that's my focus uh, setting, um, the questions of the legal status of land uh, as a form of property are usually yeah, some of the issues that surround there. Then issues also around uh, definition uh, of what constitutes property. So I was trying to understand the diversity of land tenure regimes as well and the ways in which they provide for vestments or property rights. So when we look at limited real rights and the legal relationship in land property, this is very important um, when you are when you are anal analyzing um, land property, it's good to understand what are the, uh, is property, uh, property rights limited real rights, for instance. So the aspect of individual ownership of the right to land is foreign to customary land tenure. And uh, what we know is that originally, customary land tenure was not subjected to individual ownership, but more, most, most of the time, or even now, is that most of customary land tenure is uh, owned communally. So, but then we see other interventions as well that are coming in place where, which are subjecting customary land tenure to be more uh, concentrated towards individual ownership. So there are varying views as well concerning ownership where others regard it as the most absolute right whilst others state that ownership is not absolute. In the Zambian context, ownership is definitely not um, absolute from what, what, what we got to find in the sense that for instance, the, the, the constitution vests all land in Zambia in the president. And also we have the customary land tenure uh, or customary legal system, which also um, prescribes that the chiefs are actually custodians of the, uh, of the land under customary tenure and get to hold it in perpetuity on, the, on behalf of the people. So there we can already see that there's no absolute ownership uh, of land. So in terms of also limitations as regards land property, these, uh, these limitations get to interfere, of course, with one's right to enjoy um, uh, his or her own uh, property. Uh, these limitations, for instance, in the Zambian context, we have the uh, Town and Country Planning Act, for instance. Uh, it, gets to, it, it gets to have, uh, it prescribes that if what a person wants to uh, you know, come up with any developments on their piece of land or any form of subdivision, for instance, it is important that this is actually approved by the government. So you have to request and the government has to approve. So what this actually uh, reflects is that somebody actually does not have, um, uh, is restricted in the enjoyment of property rights. We also have the Water Act which also vests all water in Zambia in the president. So in the event that um, you want to use or, or there's any uh, form of, there's, there's need for any form of diversion, diversion concerning land, I mean, concerning water, um, the, the Water Act prescribes what should happen. So uh, in terms of absolute ownership of land in that context, definitely um, that falls short. Then there's also limitations that are imposed um, by law and are usually influenced by various factors. And these various factors are the social, economic, and political um, uh, factors. Yeah, so when we look at legal uh, pluralism and property rights as well, this is one key area. Um, legal pluralism definitely refers to two or more legal systems coexisting within society. The Zambian uh, legal system comprises of the statutory legal system as well as the customary legal system, which are operating officially uh, within the society. So when we also look at legal pluralism, it also um, uh, prescribes uh, that, for instance, laws uh, comprise of rules and regulations, which are definitely uh, created by the legislature and also uh, interpreted by the judiciary, uh, but uh, as well as enforced by the by the executive. But what is very important to note is that laws are not only confined to administrative orders, for instance, to rules and regulations, um, as well as, for instance, court decisions, but that laws sh should also extend or actually do extend to customary systems, uh, which comprise of customary norms and customary practices. So the statutory, uh, these systems are also usually in conflict with, with each other. We see in the, in, the, in the Zambian constitution, there's article 23, which actually prescribes that, um, 
For instance, no one shall, no, shall not be uh, discriminated on, un, on the grounds of sex. There's so many other grounds, but under the grounds of sex is one of them. But we also see a, a, a different, a, another form of conflict where uh, customary, land, uh, customary legal system prescribes um, that um, does, actually gets to discriminate against a person uh, on the basis of their, their sex, especially women when it comes to land allocation. So these statutory legal systems and laws are usually superior as opposed to customary laws and, uh, and, and practices. We see that, I think that's, that's very clear. But one thing that should be noted is that legal systems should not exist in isolation, but that they should interact with one another. And um, as we talked about, coexist. You know, they should influence each other and interact. Then also efforts to consolidate the understanding of property rights is usually leans towards the statutory system and ends up being unitary. Um, uh, this is evidenced, of course, in, in aspects where land property rights are codified in pieces of legislation, uh, mainly to enhance security of tenure, for instance. Um, but the dominance of this approach definitely signifies that customary systems do not adequately um, uh, protect uh, 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 land tenure or prescribed land tenure security. We have the Lands Act, which actually recognizes customary land uh, tenure, but it does not prescribe for its administration. It prescribes for the administration of statutory tenure. So it can also be concluded that the Lands Act fails to actually provide for security of tenure under, customary, under, custom, the, under the customary tenure. And also it fails to actually protect, promote uh, the rights of uh, or title uh, entitlements of customary land holders, for instance. Then also there's so many uncertainties and ambigui ambiguities of customary land tenure, which are posed by irregularities. Irregularities, these are mainly um, uh, are springing forth from the aspect of constantly upholding statutory tenure to be more superior than customary tenure, which has, in fact, which has actually resulted in affecting the recognition, promotion, um, uh, and realization of customary land tenure uh, property, property rights. So then also when we look at the political economy uh, of, uh, and um, again as property rights, it is very important to also understand that land from a to understand land from a political economy perspective. Why do I say this? Because uh, this has definitely influenced how land property is definitely perceived. Uh, Karl Marx explained that it is important to actually look at property from a perspective of one's existence um, and also one's relationship with the earth. So this therefore uh, refers to one's attitude to the prerequisite present to him and um, by virtue of his or her existence and his relationship that that person particularly has uh, to the natural conditions of production. So land, landed property um, therefore uh, definitely uh, ignites the fact that uh, it's, a, it's an active real relationship to uh, conditions of production. And therefore laws and also policies definitely need to be, you know, to create a conducive environment, a legally conducive environment in the promotion of property, uh, of property rights for individuals as well as um, just generally as communities. So during colonization uh, in Zambia, there's so many uh, issues that uh, significant changes are going to happen. And one of them definitely was the aspect of discrimination against indigenous people uh, as regards their land, but also the aspect of uh, the colonizers um, uh, uh, pushing forward their interests, the economic interests uh, within some policies that were actually developed. And some of these policies that uh, um, uh, I have highlighted here, the Land Conversion of Titles Act, the creation of trust lands reserves, um, uh, 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 and the Northern Rhodesia Native Trust Land Orders and Council of 1947, 1911, 1924, as well as the Royal Charter. They all reflected, uh, they've since been um, repealed, but they also all reflected the aspect of uh, the economic interest of the colonizers in the Zambian land. So leading uh, after, after all this, uh, Zambia gained its, gained its independence in 1964, and some of the key drivers of the independence struggle were mainly to gain back land, as well as the political freedom that was actually lost during colonization. 
So some of the findings and recommendations, I will not, because of time, I will not just explain most of them, but I'll just mention them. The aspect, of course, of investment of land in the president and chiefs retaining custodianship um, of land reflects definitely the underlying reality that there is no individual absolute ownership of land in Zambia. I explained this. What are owned are real rights to land, which can be limited by rights of others as well as the, as the law. Uh, individuals and groups of individuals definitely have real relationships to land, and these, the, their rights are definitely um, uh, uh, are limited rights. So customary land dwellers also do not enjoy ownership, to, uh, ownership or have ownership of land, um, uh, mainly mainly also because there's so many, quite a number of, of limitations. And there's also the aspect of enforcement and systems and, and, and mechanisms. There's definitely need to regulate this. There's definitely need to strengthen monitoring. And uh, one key thing that, I, uh, that was also very prominent was the aspect of the customary land holding certificates, uh, which are being rolled out in the different um, uh, communities under customary tenure. But, uh, it, it's also important that there are guidelines for this customary land holding certificates. What, what do they entail? Uh, what, uh, what, what entitlements do they, you know, do, do customary land holders have by having this customary land holding certificates? So uh, that, that, that should also be, I think, clarified with those guidelines. Then there are aspects of, of course, policies and laws which definitely need to, uh, to, to maintain or enhance equality and, and tenure security. Uh, then there's also the aspect of access to justice. I think most customary land dwellers usually fall short when it comes to accessing justice, mainly because of geographical uh, issues, but also of institutional issues. So um, this, were what, this is some of the, the findings. The aspect of the land tribunal in Zambia not being autonomous, but more, uh, and also um, decentralized, and there's need for that autonomy uh, in, in, in their operations. The aspect of gender inequality should also be addressed and, and finally, harmonization of customary land tenure interventions should definitely correlate statutory land tenure. Uh, if we have to look at um, the aspect that I talked about of superiority, I think if we need to harmonize that, there's need for that correlation. Thank you, Syriac, that ends my presentation. Thank you uh, so much, um, Dimona. This is, this is really a very fascinating uh, 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 presentation. Uh, and the, the way that you, you really uh, presented it uh, raised a lot of uh, 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 issues. Uh, the common denominator between Demuna's presentation and uh, Faustina's uh, presentation is that this kind of shifting, um, you know, that we are seeing, uh, you know, towards a new liberal market-oriented approach for land governance is actually putting Africa's commons and, uh, Africa, and, and Africa's uh, and the land rights for the original, you know, uh, 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 African uh, uh, land users, you know, uh, uh, under threat. You know, they are, uh, they are under enormous threat because they open up the market to penetrate into this kind of, uh, you know, uh, areas, pushing out uh, the local land users converting the commons into different uses, being mining, as a, as a Faustina uh, was, was, you know, was highlighting, uh, uh, um, and so forth and so on. And what is fascinating here, as Demona is highlighting, is that actually even the policy, the current policies that we are having, is actually. Fa facilitating that the process of land grab that is happening there as the land law seems not even to acknowledge, uh, you know, all those kind of a customer land uh, tenure uh, regimes and uh, which underguide the preservation of uh, uh, Africa's commons and those who uh, uh, who depend on those, you know, on those commons for livelihoods and other activities. Very fascinating uh, 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 
you know, presentation, raising serious issues about where we are going. Hence, hence the, the topic of this panel, the destinies of Africa's uh, 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 commons in the current uh, uh, modernizing, you know, Africa. Yeah, so uh, really very much uh, to pound, uh, you know, about and the thought, you know, food of thought uh, around these issues and how these issues are actually, uh, you know, unfolding in different contexts around the continent, I mean, in West Africa, uh, in, 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 even in Southern Africa, as Demuna was saying, was saying here, uh, Demuna raising serious issues, whether we can move towards a much plurality of roles that can actually, you know, help to preserve and to secure or, or, or to protect the Africa's commons from the invaders, uh, from the invaders from uh, outside, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, area that, uh, you know, came into this area under different, uh, you know, uh, 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 reasons. Um, let me, from uh, Southern Africa, and again, uh, um, please, if you've got the questions, uh, go straight to the Q&A, uh, put up the questions there, and then mention who you are addressing uh, the question or to who you wanted to, uh, to address your questions or comment, and then we should come back to, you know, to that. I'm really I'm feeling excited. I'm feeling really this conversation is really taking us, uh, you know, somewhere. Thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, from um, Southern Africa, let's see what is happening in East Africa. We were in West Africa. We come down to Southern Africa. Let's go to East Africa now to see how these issues are playing out in the, uh, in, in, in the context uh, uh, there. Uh, please do allow me to uh, bring on board another dynamic, uh, capable young uh, woman uh, by the name of uh, Fortine Baisenge uh, from Rwanda. Uh, who is a, a lecturer of rural development at the Protestant University of Rwanda and uh, currently a PhD candidate at the University of, uh, of, uh, of Gisen in Germany. Over to you, uh, Fortine. Uh, Fortine? Uh, it does seem that we, uh, we have lost the connection with a Fortine. Uh, we try to, to see if we can, uh, we, can uh, we, we, we can we can we can reconnect with uh, with her in a, in a few seconds. Um, maybe while we are waiting to connect with her, let me come back to um, you know to, to to Southern African region and. Uh, uh, bring up uh, another fabulous, fantastic young woman, young woman uh, by the name of uh, Natasha uh, Bruna from uh, uh, from Mozambique, who would uh, actually looking at these issues from another particular, uh, you know, uh, perspective or bringing in another aspect to these issues from a climate change, uh, you know, uh, perspective. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, Natasha is from Mozambique and uh, she is uh, currently a PhD uh, candidate at the Institute of uh, Social Studies uh, uh, in The Hague. Over to you, Natasha. Uh, thank you, Syriac. Let me just share uh, my slides. I hope you can hear me and see my slides. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think it's already time to bring some environmental issues to this debate. Um, so today I will talk about climate change and how climate change went from uh, imposing limits to production uh, to actually being co-opted by global processes of accumulation. Uh, okay, uh, so concerns about climate change have become mainstream and global. Um, so global, global economy today is becoming, becoming greener than ever. So being green or environmentally friendly has become the new trend, as you can see from the pictures I put here in the slide. Um, 
from different projects around the world that uh, are advocating for the Go Green movement and of course had, uh, have a lot of implications on how capitalism works uh, uh, currently. Uh, as you can see, from energy, food, even beauty products and other products uh, uh, are being uh, led to this uh, green path uh, that we see happening today. So the whole value chain, the process of production, the packaging, the distribution and the markets all follow uh, that trend. Uh, everything has to be environmentally friendly, everything has to be uh, reducing emissions and so on. So these processes are of course transforming the global economy and production processes. Uh, what we see are diversified environmentally friendly investments in agriculture, clean energy projects, policies to mitigate and policies to adapt to climate change. So this has become a top priority, especially in countries of the global south uh, and in particular in countries uh, in Africa. In 2010, in this context, the World Bank called for a climate smart world. That means that uh, climate smart policies should be implemented. What are climate smart policies then? These are policies that aim a greener path of economic growth. So mainstream institutions such as the World Bank itself, the FAO, UN, the IPCC, uh, they are strongly suggesting the implementation of these policies, uh, climate smart policies, red plus and so on. But the question is, what are the implications of all of these uh, 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 policies to global processes of accumulation? What does this mean in terms of the commons? And what does this mean in terms of rural livelihoods? To answer these questions, uh, we have to analyze climate change dynamics uh, uh, in Africa and my, my research focused particularly in Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world and it has a number of risks such as um, the decrease in yield um, production of major food crops, uh, risk of sea level rise um, on coastal population, uh, loss of national land area and also a big risk in terms of um, natural hazard and extreme weather events such as drought, cyclones and, and, and others. But on the other side, Mozambique's, uh, Mozambique has a big potential in terms of the biodiversity. Um, and this crucial combination of being, of the need to adapt as it's said by these mainstream institutions and um, the potential in biodiversity makes Mozambique a great receiver of climate funds and a strategic place to implement climate change mitigation and adaptation policies. Um, well, for this study, I looked at two different uh, policies, which are both land-based inter interventions. The, the first one is Red Plus, and the second one is Climate Smart Agriculture. Red Plus, as most of you know, um, is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And specifically for Mozambique, the national strategy of Red Plus works through multi-sectoral integrated landscape interventions. This means that it includes um, not only the promotion, as they state, the promotion of rural development, uh, but also attracting green investment in agriculture, forestry, uh, and energy, and even infrastructure. On the other hand, Climate Smart Agriculture aims at three um, uh, main objectives simultaneously, which are first to increase agricultural productivity. The second one is to adapt and build resilience to climate change. And the third one would be reduce those emissions. I bring here two cases. And the first case um, was the reestablishment of, uh, of the Gilet National Reserve. Um, this was uh, an old conservation area and then the, the reestablishment of the area was uh, claiming that rural households that live in the surroundings of the reserve have to use the land in a way that is compatible to conservation and in a way that is compatible to tourism uh, based on nature. So they had, had to change their, their livelihoods. 
And by analyzing, by analyzing this, the implementation of this program, um, we see that it was clear that there was a rupture in their livelihoods because their livelihoods are mostly forest-based uh, uh, um, livelihood strategies. So this means that their livelihoods were based in access to the commons. And these include mostly hunting and fishing and, and having access to other forest resources. Um, and they tried, the reserve tried, the whole program actually tried to use climate smart agriculture as a way to compensate the loss uh, uh, of access to forest resources. But the data collected on the field indicates that this not, did not compensate the loss of livelihoods, but it is actually a strategy to protect the biodiversity of the reserve. So it doesn't really go uh, with the interest of, of the households. Uh, the second case is also part of the Red Plus national strategy that foresees the intensification of tree plantations. Um, and it was in this context that the Portocel Mozambique, uh, one of the largest mega projects in Mozambique, they acquired around uh, 350,000 hectares in Mozambique. And the World Bank is actually an investor through the IFC with 20% share hold, as a shareholder. And it is also a technical advisor because they're also enforcing the use of climate smart agriculture in that area. Um, the thing is that the Portocel's land occupation model does not comply with the Mozambican land law because uh, the land law enforces the identification and resettlement of any household that, that goes through expropriation of land. And instead of resettling uh, the households, the company agreed with the government to provide agricultural inputs and technical assistance um, in exchange of land. In other words, climate smart agriculture was being used as a tool uh, uh, to legitimize this process of land expropriation. So of course this was beneficial to the company uh, because the company was able to get cheap land and cheap labor in that, uh, in that area. And the findings uh, show that many of the households ended up landless, so uh, ready to offer the, the, their label to the company um, and with no means to produce food. So the few of the households who got the opportunity to be employed by the company claim to be very badly paid. Um, so trying to analyze this through a political economy and ecology lens, uh, what we see is that looking at the experience of Gilet, we see that Red Plus constitutes a mechanism through which a new commodity is created. As we know, carbon emissions and sequestration are at the core of the global environmental crisis and policy enforcement. So on one side, we have the demand for carbon or emission rights from these industrialized development uh, poles. And on the other side, we have the existence of potential suppliers, uh, 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 carbon suppliers, particular global South countries in Mozambique. Um, so this creates the perfect opportunity to, to, to carbon transaction to happen. Uh, consequently, a market is born, and this market is called carbon market. So carbon has become a commodity. And on, as you can see, I tried to, to come up with a, a tentatively, this is a carbon commodity chain, as you can see, from the production of carbon credits. And the production of carbon credits involves actually expropriation of resources and expropriation of emission rights from the rural poor. And you can see that the value chain goes all the way to the consumers who are probably multinationals who will buy the carbon permits in order to keep polluting somewhere, uh, somewhere else in the globe. So a new form, let's say that it's a new form of primitive accumulation. Uh, looking on the other hand on the experience of Portocel, we see another way in which accumulation is fueled through these climate change uh, policies, mitigation adaptation. And it's actually through creating new ways to legitimize processes of expropriation. So this is what Portocel is actually doing. They are 
legitimizing the process of land grabbing using uh, climate smart agriculture as a tool. Um, and one important thing to add in both of these processes is that they're both supported uh, 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 and partially maybe implemented by the state. And in this case of Porto Cell, the, the it was supported by the state for two main reasons. First is because Porto Cell did not comply with the national regulations uh, regarding um, land occupation. And second, because no action from the state was actually put in place uh, in order to prioritize households' needs and interests, even when the national legislation protected them. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that a closer look to these processes, uh, the, the current environmental crisis and, and everything, uh, we can see that climate change and the policies and the schemes to address it, um, which were initially perceived as threats to accumulation, uh, have actually been co-opted by global capital and integrated into the global processes of accumulation in many ways. And all of this, of course, uh, 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 means that um, there will be a further exploitation of rural livelihoods for this to take place. And uh, once again, is of course materialized with the aid of the state itself. Um, hence, a new frontier of accumulation arises in so far as climate change is further augmenting new forms of primitive accumulation, creating new commodities and new opportunities for accumulation by expanded reprodu reproduction. And that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Super. Uh... Uh, thank you so much, uh, Natasha. This is really another fabulous uh, presentation, which uh, uh, to a great extent, you know, shows <laughs> shows how the how poor uh, ordinary citizens in Africa are actually uh, bearing the you know bearing the the the, the, um, the bearing the burden of the climate. Uh, you, you know, uh, 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 the environmental calamities that are happening there. Um, maybe for people who might not be familiar with the African uh, continent, uh, the colleagues who are viewing this presentation around the world, uh, just to put things in a context a little bit, uh, I, I, one can, uh, can, for instance, you know, mention this whole mushrooming of protected area, parks, some of them transboundary, you know, uh, parks under the, the, in the, in the, in the large, large, very large protected areas under the, you know, the, 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 the argument that, uh, you know, they are trying to mitigate the climate change and, the, you know, closing out the land users who are, who, who are you know, who are relying on those, uh, you know, commons for the, the, the livelihoods. One of them, for instance, the transboundary Kaza Park, uh, which is which borders uh, between Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and the Zimbabwe. It is it is the size of France. That is how big that uh, conservation you know area you know is. And uh, as uh, Natasha has uh, you know has has, has has rightly argued in this particular you know uh, 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 pre, pre, you know uh, 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 presentation. Uh, although they, they, you know, they come up with those arguments that they are trying to create all this conservation, the, the areas that protected this planting uh, forest and so forth and so on, closing out the commons so that the people may not use it uh, for climate justification. But in actual fact, is the uh, accumulation processes that are happening there, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, uh, transplanting or that are shifting uh, or uh, pushing away uh, the, 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 the local uh, 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 users of the commons and the, and the using these commons for private interest to accumulate rather than to, you know, to, 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 for, for climate, uh, uh, you know, purposes as, 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 as they are claiming to be. Uh, so it will be very fascinating to engage with Natasha for this environmental 
you know, uh, 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 aspect that she, bring, she brings into this kind of discussions, uh, which is a common phenomenon across the continent, not only in Southern Africa, but across the, you know, in East Africa, in West Africa. This is the common phenomenon that we are seeing happening there. Again, who is bearing the, you know, uh, uh, this burden is the rural poor, is the original citizen who are, uh, who are relying on these commons for their daily to day, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, livelihoods uh, that are being lost. Uh, so uh, I don't want to take much time. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me go back uh, to East Africa and uh, try to bring on board um, Fortine by saying, uh, I was saying that she is uh, from Rwanda and uh, she's a lecturer of rural development at the Protestant University of uh, 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 you know, for Rwanda and a PhD candidate at the University of Jason in German. Over to you, Fortin. Uh, thank you very much, Syriac. Uh, I'm happy to go through this presentation. And now let me share with you the, the slide, my, my PowerPoint presentation. Um, Okay, uh, I'm happy to present about the impact of zoning regulations on land tenure security in the fringe of uh, Chigari City, Rwanda. Uh, to start with, uh, land tenure security uh, is urban, in urban space draws from uh, affordable housing development standard by landowners, and the inverse uh, of this situation shall result in the exclusion of the poor or low-income landowners from the common. And this is a statement from uh, UN uh, habitat, uh, and this uh, is actually uh, showing that uh, in uh, the contemporary uh, society we are living in today that uh, taking the case of Rwanda, uh, uh, the change in uh, urban uh, uh, spaces uh, may affect land owners uh, who are low income uh, holders. Uh, just uh, a little bit uh, uh, about the <laughs> Uh, Chigari City or the context of Chigari City, Rwanda. In aftermath of genocide uh, perpetrated against the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994, the Chigari City experienced an unprecedented population, uh, uh, population growth, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, spread it, uh, the large scale urbanization processes. And uh, to, uh, to address this uh, concern, the government of Rwanda established a Chigari conceptual master plan by which a large track of agriculture land have been converted in the res into residential use. And then uh, from this legal and the development framework, uh, many changes uh, in zoning regulation uh, or housing development standards were uh, imposed um, in urbanized areas in the rural urban fringe of the Chigari city. And uh, Following this uh, new regulation, uh, land owners have to comply with uh, this regulation uh, as a condition to enjoy their property right. And also, uh, alongside this, uh, land titling program implement implemented since 2008 in Rwanda which in normally guarantee, uh, guarantees the individual property right with different patterns of tenure security uh, is there. So uh, 
the, the, the question uh, or the objective of this study is to explore or to understand the impact of these new zoning regulations on tenure security of landowners, especially in the urban uh, fringes of Chigari City. Uh, so to achieve this objective, uh, we the, the study draws uh, from a land governance framework uh, by which we assess uh, the regulation and the processes and the structure of land use planning system used by the Chigari city uh, in order to know how this system is affecting uh, uh, these landowners, especially in the Chigari uh, fringe, fringes. And the study used a case study uh, where we took uh, uh, one neighbor neighborhood uh, in the Chigari area called the Karama, and we contacted, uh, we conducted a, a survey uh, uh, where uh, we, we took a head of household, and we also use interview. Uh, we we also use inter structured interviews and SPSS to to analyze the quantitative data. So. Um, uh, with the question uh, regarding uh, how these regulations are affecting uh, the uh, tenure security in this area, the study uh, realized that uh, First of all, the system uh, used by the government uh, to make uh, master plans uh, is a top-down approach. is not is not uh, participatory and is not uh, reflect different needs and interests and 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 the capabilities of landowners to develop the required houses in this area. Uh, why? Because uh, most of these people who are living in by per urban uh, uh, areas in Chigari city, they are formerly or they are normally uh, uh, living uh, by agriculture activities. So their income is, is, is very low and that's why uh, with regard to, to compliances, they, they fail to comply with all these uh, standards uh, that are set by the government through uh, this master plan. Um, yeah, and then also uh, the study found out that uh, the, the the alternative for the majority of people who are living in by urban uh, per urban uh, Ch Chigari city, uh, they 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 don't they have only uh, option of selling the the land and the leave the area. Uh, if not, uh, for example, if they if they have more plot of land, they try to sell one part of, of, of that land and then uh, to find maybe um, money to, to build uh, the required house. Okay. Um, so as, as the study shows, uh, just to conclude, uh, the study shows that the land tenure uh, uh, insecurity is a reality for these landowners with low income in the urban areas of Chigari City. Also, the, the study found find out that the, the system uh, uh, spread up uh, around the market uh, because if the these uh, land owners fail to comply with these conditions of building required houses then they have to sell their plot and they have to uh, to to find another way of living and this uh, generate a high uh, land market which in some cases have a high risk of, of being instrumentalized by elites and 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 also the system uh, the study found find out that the system leads to the exclusion of the poor uh, or, or especially uh, you know in in uh, uh, areas where uh, people used to live by farming farming activities so these these people they they have to quit they have to live uh, from the urban space 
and this has a consequence of uh, for these poor people to 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 uh, not access uh, the, the commons such as public amenities uh, like water uh, uh, tarmac roads electricity uh, and so on and also uh, these, uh, the study also realized that the large scale urbanization of Chigari city uh, uh, overused the common land space, uh, where uh, in the urban fringes, for example, uh, the, the the, this, uh, this, 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 the land that was normally hosting forest and world animals is also used for, for residential use. Also, uh, the system uh, has a risk uh, for people to, to be more impoverished because uh, after selling their land, uh, farmers or these people with low income, they have a risk of, they, they have the option of migrating to find out whatever to do or wherever to stay in another area of the country and this uh, the study found out that it's, it's not easy for these people to reconnect again to a stable economic activity okay the study then argues that uh, an equitable uh, land use planning system can be uh, effective strategy to enhance this tenuous security and inclusion of raw income land owners in the urban fringes of of chigari city and this uh, effective uh, uh, plan land, land use planning system uh, uh, should use um, demonstrate uh, uh, or reflect different uh, categories of land owners as uh, they are they are in per in the per urban uh, uh, areas in Tigari city the, this system should uh, show or river room for high standing residential uh, area middle standing row standing and and a place for agriculture because uh, otherwise the, the 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 people who are living by agriculture will will uh, will, will be excluded Okay, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention and thank you, Siri, for giving me this good opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for Tine uh, for another exciting um, presentation. Um, this, is really, this is really great. I mean, uh, the dynamic that for Tine is highlighting here, um, which enrich uh, this conversation is the impact of the growing urbanization on the African continent is having on the Africa's commons. Uh, this, is a, this phenomenon is not only limited in the East Africa, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a common phenomenon on the African continent. We're having growing cities, we're having uh, rapid you know, uh, urbanization happening across the continent. And as this, uh, this urbanization is, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is, is increasing, is pushing people you know, out who then left with no other option other than invading the commons or destroying the commons in one way or another. This is a really fabulous, fabulous uh, another angle to look at how you know uh, Africa's commons are under threat, are under it attack from different you know uh, angles. If if you can put all these four presentations together, uh, for instance, the Faustina and the and the and the Imuna demonstrated the powerfully how the rapid uh, increasing land commodification uh, driven by new liberal market oriented policies are affecting negatively the preservation and the, and the, the use of the commons across the continent. And then uh, 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 Natasha uh, brought in another angle, very, very important angle, which is another phenomenon which is uh, quite widespread on the African continent, which is the mushrooming of this uh, environmental, you know, uh, in, in, environmental conservation and the parks around the continent for different reasons for you know for, for you know for tourism or for or for you know, for climate change justification uh, in one way or another but how that in itself 
uh, you know, is affecting or is threatening the African commons and the those who depend on, uh, on the commons. And uh, now, uh, Fortine is concluding this uh, uh, discussion, showing another important phenomenon currently happening on the African continent, which is the rapid urbanization happening on the continent, how that phenomenon is, 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 is threatening, is, 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 is actually having direct negative effect on Africa's commons as more and more people flocking to the, you know, to these cities, uh, cities uh, pushing out other cities and, you know, other people and they ended up, uh, you know, uh, into the destruction of the commons or the use of the commons or the conversion of the commons to accumulate or to, uh, yeah, 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 to, uh, yeah to, to, to be able to, to accommodate uh, the challenges that comes with the rapid urbanization happening on the continent. This is a really fascinating uh, presentation uh, for these young African minds. I'm uh, very proud to have you on this panel. Um, there is uh, quite a lot of questions that uh, have, uh, have, uh, have, have, have put, uh, you know, have put to us. I will ask Michael to bear with us for more few minutes to, you know, I, I, we want to take all these questions probably uh, on the on time they can go up uh, and uh, respond to this question. But let me take uh, these two these two questions here. I'm looking at the uh, was Please forgive me if I pronounce uh, uh, if I don't pronounce where your your name was Mudamure. Uh, he said. Or he or she, she said, thank you all of such uh, interesting presentation. My question goes to all of the panelists. I would like you to elaborate on the concept of the common itself. What are the commons for you? And with all these scenarios of, uh, of commoditization, conflicts, exp uh, expropriation that you have mentioned, would you say that we are heading to a tragedy of commons? How do you imagine the future of the commons in the post COVID 19 period and what role can local population and institution play in assuming secure access to land and other commons, especially for women and the vulnerable groups? Um, this is for all, um, for all our panelists uh, who wanted to start to crack on that. Uh, uh, rather very profound, <laughs> wide-ranging question here. Who wanted to go first? Have you heard the question? Uh, hello? Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 okay. Uh, Fortina, you wanted to go. You want to go first? Oh, uh, okay. Um... <laughs> Uh, the question I think is very broad, but uh, just uh, I think she wants or he wants to know uh, what is our point of view for the future of the commons really in Africa. Uh, but uh, then from my uh, point of view, uh, drawing from the situation of Rwanda, I can just uh, simply, simply say that uh, uh, the commons, uh, there is a, 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 a big danger for the commons in Africa as, uh, you know, the population is increasing highly in Africa and uh, uh, the, the, the urbanization is, is, a, is a phenomena, the, the climate ch change is, a, is another one, and the, uh, the process of accumulation, especially through the, the modern agriculture or smart uh, farming system, whatever you call it. So all these are, are, are sacrificing the, the, the common uh, uh, interest in common property, if I can say that. So uh, I don't know if uh, he or she wants me to uh, to go further, but uh, sim simply uh, I can tell uh, that person that the future of, of African uh, common uh, is in danger. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, over to you for Tine. Uh, not for Tina, so sorry for Tina. <laughs> okay, so um, in in the context of my study, I place land within the the whole idea of commons, 
and to see land as an, as an asset that should be that has been used by the past generation is being used by the current generation and it should be available for use by the 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 coming generation and also the 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 norms and and conventions and rules governing this use should be egalitarian enough such that every person within that particular enclave should be able to have the opportunity to use that land and that is how i conceive land in in the sense of a common within the cocoa landscape so with this whole scenario of commodification i would say um we the the commodification is is coming in and it seems to be a part of the whole process of liberalization that has already sort of gained grounds within the cocoa landscape and the challenge is to um to to think about whether it's possible to really halt the process of commodification right now and if the process of commodification cannot be halted then how do we make sure that both the customary um, governance system and the common law governance system, or the statutory system really adapts and become more nuanced to start thinking about other forms of tenure to make sure that the, the current um, level of commodification doesn't um, make land an, an asset that can be um, um, become a property of individual persons and that eventually if it moves into mining small scale mining then it means that that land is no longer available in in the context of cocoa production so that is how i see it for a tragedy i i i think it's it's in the foreseeable future <laughs> but i also think that um the the land tenure system within the cocoa landscape can be able to adapt if if people would want to think about a more nuanced view of protecting land as a common within the cocoa landscape. Excellent. Thank you so much, Faustina. Uh, 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 Natasha? Um, well, uh, I think my colleagues, uh, both of them, they, they explained, uh, they, they had a good approaches to answer this question. This actually is a question from Wasitisa Mandamul. And yes, Siriak, you destroyed her name. But okay, <laughs> but it's fine. It's a very good question. I think it's a question to a whole research project, but I can answer the question um, focusing on the environmental uh, uh, part of this debate. Um, I think, of course, the literature on the commons is very important to look at this, uh, at what is happening at the environmental crisis and what are the implications uh, um, to, to, in terms of resource grabbing, for example, and in terms of what are the implications to rural livelihoods. And um, there is, uh, within the literature, uh, this big body of literature, there is uh, a paper from Paul Stern, which he explores the principles for governing the commons. And he goes um, from managing local commons and managing global commons. And I think this is very useful if we want to um, analyze what is happening in terms of climate change, in terms of the implementation of climate change mitigation and adaptation policies, and what is, what are the, what, who, who are the winners and who are the losers on this, uh, uh, on this whole process. But I still think there are, there is space in this uh, commons literature to look at uh, further at issues uh, such as uh, climate injustice that is happening because um, if, if we think about climate justice and, 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 and in this whole context then we have to analyze exactly uh, who is polluting, ask some, some relevant questions in, in this context. Some of these questions would be who is polluting, right? Uh, who is winning with this pollution, with this process of, of pollution? Uh, who is accumulating with all of this and who brought us to this crisis actually and whose resources are being used as a solution to the crisis. Uh, so we have how to manage these local commons and global commons. So I think there's a lot of potential in this literature and environmental issues. I had one question directed, uh, I, I'm not sure if I can answer the question or we're having a second round or... 
Um, yeah. uh, just uh, the time, the time, I wish we would have had uh, enough time to, there's actually a lot of questions, very fascinating um, questions, and uh, I'm afraid that won't be able to, you know, to answer, you know, to all of them. Uh, to some of those questions, maybe you can uh, type in the, in the chat or in the, yeah, in the chat to answer you know, to answer there uh, because of for the interest of time, because time is uh, on our, is not on our side. Uh, but uh, let's 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 uh, um, let's, let, let, let's 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 hear from Demuna. Uh, Demuna, we, uh, tragedy of the commons. We're in trouble here. Okay. First, um, I think in answering the the question uh, concerning what what does the commons uh, mean, for instance. Uh, what do I think about the commons? Um, I'll look at it from the legal perspective, of course. And um, for me, it mainly looks at, or con will be considering, of course, the aspect of the legal, uh, having a legally conducive environment that gets to promote and protect uh, property rights of individuals, uh, as well as the communities. So when you look at it from that aspect, looking at systems, looking at policies, looking at, uh, of course, laws, looking at processes or procedures, if it's in land administration, issues of equality, and all those that, get, that, that, that come into play when it comes to um, uh, issues of land. So I think for me, with the commons, I'll be looking at it from that perspective. Uh, I look at it from that perspective. And also, when you, the, um, there was an aspect of conflicts. So when we're also looking at the commons, well, there, there's definitely quite a number of land uh, disputes that get to arise or that have a reason in the, in the different jurisdictions, even just across Africa. So it's about access to justice, for instance, even for the communities, from, for rural communities that dwell on, uh, if it's customary land tenure, are they able to access justice? What are the hindrances um, uh, that are there? I think in my presentation, I got to mention the aspect of geographical uh, challenges and just other technicalities uh, which actually hinder uh, our people, rural populations in accessing justice. So when it comes to conflict and dispute resolution and stuff like that, it's what do we have in place to ensure that people get to actually uh, access the, 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 the access justice that they actually uh, uh, require. Then also there's this aspect of, um, I think women, how, what do we do, uh, um, uh, especially to uh, enhance or uh, assure secure access to land for vulnerable groups as well as um, uh, for women uh, in general, vulnerable groups, class, uh, classifying them in that, in, in that sense. Um, I think it's mainly ha coming up with interventions that get to uh, promote uh, their rights, knowing that they're the weaker party, um, knowing that there are so many um, uh, issues or so many aspects that get to surround uh, uh, their enjoyment of, of certain rights. So even just taking part in, the, uh, in, in issues that get to concern uh, property rights or, 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 or land rights, stuff like that. So it's just having interventions uh, that get to actually accommodate vulnerable groups. Um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would answer the question in that, in that sense. Excellent. Thank you. Actually, that that uh, uh, that answers um, some of the the, the questions. Uh, maybe uh, one minute for each of you to answer this question by Evaristo uh, Mapenza, uh, who said to all panelists, "What are the new common solutions uh, taking into account new ideas from the youth?" Um, do you have the solution? <laughs> Who wants just one minute and then we conclude? <laughs> Who wants to go first? Um, okay, okay, go. Yeah, okay, okay, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, let me. Um... Uh, say something that shortly uh, uh, the commons. Uh, in my case, I take the case of uh, of land in Rwanda, and uh, linking it to the youth uh, issues currently uh, uh, in Rwanda, the land is is scarce, is small. Actually, even for for uh, the category of. Um, 
uh, old people <laughs> already say that. But the problem is that youth are, are not uh, interested by, by farming activities, for example. So uh, I don't know how they access these uh, commons or this important resource, uh, which is the land, if they are not interested. And uh, they, they just want to, to, to go to the cities and, and to run from up and down, but they are not interested by, by the agriculture, by farming activities and so on. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a pro problematic also on both sides, uh, on the side of demand and on the side of supply. Uh, the government also in Rwanda, and, and I think it's the same in, in East Africa, is not interesting uh, f young people uh, uh, to be in uh, in agriculture, in the tourism sector, in uh, in the water, uh, in, in the lakes, uh, uh, management, and so on. So the, the, they are just in technology and uh, uh, and the service uh, sector. So. Uh, for me, uh, I think it's a it's a high concern. I don't have a solution. I don't have a solution, but I think the solution is in the hand of the youth, of course, on one side, and and on the policy makers, uh, of course. But the youth also should have to show the interest in uh, accessing and the use of these uh, commons. Thank you for the, uh, the youth of which you are. Uh, let's uh, go fortune, to... fortune. <laughs> Very fascinating. Uh, Faustina, one minute as we are concluding. <laughs> um, for me, I think that the process of commodification is already ongoing. And then there has to be a way to accommodate the, the process of of a land market because some people by the customary norm would not also be able to assess lands and they have the, um, the, the capacity to go into the land market. So they are already within a process that is favorable because commodification is ongoing. But then I think the, um, the land governance regime in Ghana, for instance, should really be more nuanced to start thinking beyond just the customary regime and then the statutory regime to to now think about other forms of regimes, such as the social regime, in which the people who can no longer sort of compete within the, the current ongoing um, commodification or the land markets would, would have access to land within a social kind of regime. This is land for women, this is land for maybe the vulnerable in this situation, or this particular area is reserved for um, picking of forest products. This, I think it's more about the multiplicity of regimes to accommodate the more nuanced situations that are mm. within the current system, rather than, I, I don't see the, the, the solution as an either um, a legal regime or just a customary regime, but more multiplicity of regimes. I know many people think plurality is, is a challenge, but I think the, the challenge is more complex to find a solution within a partic one particular regime. Excellent. Uh, super. Thank you, uh, Faustina. Um, as we conclude, Natasha, please, your take on these questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I don't think there's a clear response to that question. I don't think we can have a clear and direct and objective response to that. Uh, but what I can say is that it's important to reflect about where we are right now. And if we think about African countries, and if I think particularly in the case of Mozambique, we see uh, that what drives or what shapes uh, rural development, let's say, or what shapes economic growth in the country are mainly external forces or external interests. We see that um, in the case of investments, in the case of funds that come into the country, aid and everything else. It's always shaped by global interests, by uh, whether it is by international market interest, the, the international demand for commodities, for uh, um, minerals, for what is going to shape the dynamics in our own country, let's say. So instead of looking at what are the global and external interests and, and, and needs, we should focus first in our own 
local uh, needs and interests. What does a country like Mozambique, like Zambia, what, um, like Ghana needs in terms of, uh, uh, of human development, let's say? What do we need? What, how can we tackle the roots of poverty and not exactly being answering to uh, global and international interests? Um, so stop responding to global interest and stop looking inside, some, within ourselves. What, what is missing? What, what, do you, that, what do we need to do to ourselves, let's say? I think that is a good start to that debate. And you put that and plus, you add the, 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 the debate, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm the environmental uh, <laughs> person here. So I would put also the debate on environment because this is a global concern, it's a global issue. But of course, always coming or, or bringing in the insights and the, the very interesting and very important insights of climate uh, justice. So I think that, that those are maybe good points to begin to answer that mm. question. <laughs> Yes. Super. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natasha. Very fabulous um, uh, answers here uh, coming from this powerful young African man. Yeah. Dimona, uh, your, your take, please. Okay. Uh, for me, I think it's mainly, um, of course, I think Faustina has talked about the, the aspect of, I think, systems interacting. Um, um, and I think that's the same uh, issue that I also have from the legal perspective side. It's also about the, the legal systems interacting and not necessarily um, uh, operating in isolation. So we have the statutory legal system, customary legal system, which customary legal system where, where, where customary land tenure uh, uh, is governed is the one that's usually more um, subordinate to the, to the uh, to statutory legal system, but there's that need for that harmonization. So for me, I think when I look at that, it's the aspect of harmonizing uh, the legal systems and for them to actually not operate in isolation, but um, coexist and interact and influence one another. Uh, then, um, yeah, I think I'll end there. <laughs> yeah. Super. On that note, we actually <clears throat> ended there. Uh, please uh, allow me to thank our, 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 pan our panelists who really did a great job for we wish we would have had much time to go through all these, uh, um, you know, questions, uh, very fabulous, very powerful, very interesting questions that uh, were, were raised here. But unfortunately, because of the, um, because of time, we will not be able to do so. Uh, so we'll be able to probably access this, uh, um, this presentation and continue these discussions, uh, you know, offline. So I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Ms. Demuna Piris Empire, um, uh, Natasha Bruna, uh, Faustina um, Obeng Odama, and uh, of course our sister uh, Fortine Baiseng for participating and stimulating uh, this particular, you know, uh, uh, discussion on this Yara panel. And uh, our special thanks to uh, someone whom you have seen uh, was see sitting very calmly and uh, and and deposedly somewhere there, uh, uh, Professor Marco Jansen, who have been uh, who have been supporting us and uh, making sure that the process runs smoothly. Thank you so much. Please stay safe, stay healthy, let protect. Africa's Commons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to